This week on the Rock News Weekly Podcast, week of March 13th, 2023, season 5, episode number 10. This week we talk about Roger Waters re-releasing and re-recording alternate versions of tracks for Dark Side of the Moon's 50th anniversary. Outside Lands 2023 lineup is out, and also major tour announcements from The Cure and The Violent Femmes. Dave Grohl teams up with Feed the Streets to feed the homeless in downtown Los Angeles and more. Plus this week in Rock and Roll History Trivia, Weekly WTF, and so much more. All of our links are up at rocknewsweekly.com. Watch us live every Sunday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, twitch.tv slash rocknewsweekly, and watch us on demand, youtube.com at rocknewsweekly. What's up, everybody? It's time for the Rock News Weekly Podcast. Chris here, as well as David. What's up, David? This week is shaping up. We didn't flood. We survived. We did not have to get the raft out and raft down the street. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's very severe flooding. The here. Bay Area is taking oh, it. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, all along the coast and then the mountain towns, too, and the foothills and the Sierras. Uh, it's turning into mudslide craziness. Um I'm sure everywhere, wherever our listeners are listening, they're experiencing some kind of crazy weather, no matter where you guys are at. So just be safe. Give yourself enough time to get where you're going and try and limit that travel as much as possible, man. It's crazy out there. Yeah, be careful. Um, let's get to it this week, though. Uh, rock news for the week. We got some interesting stories to talk about this week of March 13th, 2023, season five, episode number 10. We're talking about Roger Waters re-releasing and re-recording alternate versions of tracks for Dark Side of the Moon's 50th anniversary, not without some controversy there. Outside Lands 2023 lineup is out. Also major tour announcements from The Cure, Violent Femmes as well. Dave Grohl feeding up with Feed the Streets to feed the homeless in downtown Los Angeles and more. Plus this week in rock and roll history trivia, we'll get to all that as we always do. Weekly WTF. All of our links are up. Rocknewsweekly.com. Support us directly at anchor.fm slash rocknewsweekly slash subscribe. Uh, follow us on Twitch. Uh, get notified when we go live so you guys can watch us. Twitch.tv slash rocknewsweekly. Of course, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all at Rock News Weekly on multiple platforms, including Amazon Audible, uh, Spotify, all that cool stuff. All right, let's get to the tour news this week. Outside Lands 2023. August 11th through the 13th, headliners Kendrick Lamar, Foo Fighters, Odessa, Lena Del Rey, uh, the 1975, Megan Thee Stallion, Zed, Janelle Monet, Maggie Rogers, and Fisher. A lot of other artists on this one. Uh, David, you were saying you guys ended up getting tickets for the whole family, right? Yep. yep. So you guys are going. <laughs> I saw this, it. and everyone was like, I want to go, I want to go. So, <laughs> yep, we're going. Um, so you were saying, uh, what are some of your favorites uh, that you're excited to see? And then uh, you were saying your kids were pretty excited. Uh, what are the younger uh, the younger demographic. Uh, they were really excited for Bebadoobie. Oh, Bebadoobie. Yeah, however yeah. you say it. And um, let's see, who are the other ones? I played them on the garage. They're kind oh, of yeah. Cool yeah. Indie kind of group. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was the other one? Alex G is another Alex one my G, daughter okay. was really excited okay. for. Uh, my wife is a huge Kendrick Lamar fan. Ah. And I mean, I'm, I'm a fan. Yep. That's um, going to be big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lana Del Rey also. My my daughter's a big, huge fan. Um, Megan the Stallion, the Stallion, the Stallion. Yes, right. So <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'll I'll see uh, I'll see what uh, I end up going to. Are you gonna be, be um, crowd surfing during Everlong for? A few I hours? I I will be <laughs> actually. That's gonna be I, if cool they too. can get me up off the ground. Oh, they'll get you up. They'll right? get you up. We were just talking. We'll find one of those jack dudes with the vest. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that he's bench pressing Well, now there. that's the thing, because I'm <laughs> sitting here thinking, you know, I'm in a little bit of, uh, what's the feeling, uh, dr- dread, right? Because <laughs> I, cause I, I'll be there, you know, I was telling Chris, you know, we, we went to Outside Lands in 2018, and, you know, I was uh, a tad bit lighter in those days, had a little uh, yes. less pounds and sure, was looking sure. a little better. And we got out of the, got in the taxi and told him where we were going. And he said, "Aren't you guys a little old for that?" 
<laughs> now you got the full force. Dad now bod, I'm yeah, so. and I'm like full dad bod, and like even bringing the kids with me, and they're just gonna like leave me in the dust. So now you gotta you gotta get in shape like what Vince Neil had to do for Motley Crue. Oh yeah. So maybe get on his regiment, you know. Maybe I'll, I'll start like <laughs> well, I gotta do the Lance working body. class style, right? I'll be like punching sides of beef at the <laughs> okay, yeah, right? Like Rocky, yes, the Rocky style. Yeah, do that. Yes. I think that's an then, that'll be an American story. And then you could show and debut for your kids your own uh, military vest, shirt, <laughs> shirtless, at the shirtless, festival. like totally jacked. Yeah, and then take it and say, "All right, kids, we gotta take a selfie." That you know what? <laughs> if that happens, that will be a change to my life. Wait, Shaq Diesel, dude? Are Shaq, you kidding me? He's one I of didn't the ones, even realize yeah. that. My son is going to freaking crap his pants. I don't think he realizes yeah, this. Yeah, Shaq Diesel's DJ set. No way. I That's did right. not. I'm going to be DJing. I don't. <laughs> Maxwell, if you're if you're listening to this podcast, I, remind me to tell you when I get home. Shaq Diesel. Shaq man. Diesel's going to be there. It, his DJ set's going to be there. Uh, oh, my gosh. It's he is. Be killer. Wow. Okay. It's getting better, right? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to this. I think it'll be fun. This is going to be fun. So Outside Lands, August 11th through the 13th. Uh, make sure you guys check it out. Very diverse lineup this year. Very cool. Already on sale. Uh, another one that was announced is called Sound on Sound. This one's on the East Coast in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, September 30th through October 1st. They got the Chili Peppers, John Mayer, Alanis Morissette, Tran Anastasio Band, Hosier, which I haven't seen in a long time since he made that track Take Me to Church, blew up and then hmm. disappeared off the face yeah. of the planet. Seems like he's back. I don't know if he's got new music or if they're just getting him. Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweat's always good as well. Uh, Lord Huron, Dispatch, Ben Harper, Steel Pulse, great reggae group from the UK. Um, some pretty cool some pretty cool groups on here. Uh, Jim Blossoms, Deep Banana Blackout. They're Jim kind of Blossoms. Funk, funk group. Yeah, really cool stuff uh, for the East Coast here. Now, now speaking sound. of hosier, like that's a person who makes hosiery, right? <laughs> I guess, I guess so. I guess the actual maybe term. that's where he went. Maybe he was it went back to his old job, went back to his old vocation, pantyhose. right? <laughs> <laughs> the hosier. Maybe he makes le eggs. <laughs> I don't know what he does. To be honest. Okay. He's just okay. sitting on a pile of money, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's just enjoying life. Uh, all right, check this out. Violent Femmes. This is a pretty cool tour. It's the 40th anniversary of their debut self-titled album from 1983. Performing the album front to back uh, with special guest Jesse Ahern. I'm not sure who that is. I should have looked it up. Uh, maybe an original guy from the group that's not with them, but I know it's the original trio lineup uh, that's touring. A lot of the dates right now uh, for us here in California are all in Los Angeles. So it makes me wonder if they're playing a major festival like Aftershock or something else that's preventing them from releasing Northern California tour dates because you know they're going to be hitting some Northern California dates. But nothing up as of the moment. May 6th through the 12th, all Los Angeles type of dates, Pappy and Harriet, San Diego, L.A., Ventura. Uh, and then they kind of go around Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Colorado, Santa Fe, so there's really it's not a major tour. It's just basically for the month of May. Do you think that they're going to announce a bigger tour than this, or do you think this might be the only shot uh, at at seeing this? Uh, I I would kind of hope so, but I mean, what's up there, Pioneer Town? Yeah, Pioneer Town, Pappy and Harriet's. It's um, Pioneer Town. They do a lot of festivals there. Um, they have this um, kind of it's like an old westerny. A uh, place called Pioneer Town that's still like a very touristy old western town, and they have a lot of shows there. They have a couple venues and bars, and they have some hit promoters, and wow. they've turned it into kind of a a, a cool a cool spot. So it's like a like a dinner theater. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's dinner theater reenactment <laughs> and then the violin. Films? I think I think it's kind of like what you're saying though. It's like a, almost like a. Um, not it's a got a theme to yeah, it. Yeah, not a novelty. Kind of up in there in the yeah, Oaken Hills. And right. It's like this old western town, and it's become a destination uh, for people to kind of play this kind of unique style show. So Pappy Interesting. and Harriet's. Pappy yeah, and, they, and Harriet's. I know they have a festival there uh, at Pioneer Town, so it could be during that time in May. So Okay. And that's so, so yeah, I mean, I would hope so because we got a lot of people up here. Yep. So hopefully we'll get some Northern California dates. I'm guessing that they may have a tour announcement for some festival dates that may be preventing them. There's a thing called Radius Clause where they can't announce um, tour dates 
in certain areas if they are part of a festival in that area oh, because really? they want you to buy tickets for the festival and not go see them at the club show, right? Oh, okay. Okay. The festival, That's it's logical. like a draw, right? Yeah. For yeah. example, if Kendrick Lamar um, was playing at Oracle Arena the same weekend as um, uh, Outside as Lands, outside lands you'd be like, well, why don't we just go to see him at Oracle Arena instead of going to the festival, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's what the festival clause is to protect that artist for it. Usually it's two or three months before and after the dates of the festival that they can't play a show in that area at other big venues like Golden One, Sacramento, or something like that. And you said it was how, how much longer? Usually before? two to three months before and after a show. Okay, so, so you get up closer to May, we might see some other exactly. dates popping up. Exactly. I see. Exactly. So, but in this initial run of dates, these are the ones on there. They want to sell these first, and then they announce later ones to try and, uh, you know, open it up, so to speak. But they try and sell these ones out usually first run. Well, don't Excuse you just me. learn something new every day? It, it's it's one of those things. The concert industry is kind of kind of crazy. All right, here's another one, The Cure. Big tour for them. First tour in, I think, seven or six years. Seven years, it says. Um, U.S. tour is pretty big for uh, the Cure here. looks like they're going to be. Here's another one where I'm like, where's the California date? They have San Diego. They have Los Angeles. They got Shoreline. They got a couple days here, right? Um, But that's, to me, that doesn't seem very big. It seems like they could kind of do a little more than that. So I'm not sure. They're playing L.A., San Diego, and San Francisco. It looks like there could be more tour announcements from this, but this is going to be a big tour for The Cure. Um, they're calling it the, what do they call it? The Of a Lost World? Of a Lost World, I think. And that was the rumor of the new album name uh, that they were toying around with, and that's what they're naming this tour. Oh, Songs of a Lost Word, excuse oh, me. Oh, I see. Songs of a Lost Word, same, of the name, uh, same name as the album they've been teasing for several uh, years which still has not got a release date, uh, but that's the name of the tour, so I don't know if they're going to release the new album later this year. Not sure, but a uh, tour was announced uh, for you guys in California, San Diego on May 20th, May 23rd in L.A., May 27th in San Francisco. A lot of shows in May. What the heck's going yeah. on, right? Tons of shows in May. Tell you what, that, that I like The Cure yeah, a lot. That would be a cool show to see. Yeah. Um, so they're playing with the Twilight Sad as the opening group there. So you guys can check that out. All right, rock news this week. Uh, Roger Waters, always controversial, ever at odds with his former band uh, members in Pink Floyd, shared a sample of music from his controversial re-recording of the classic rock act's Dark Side of the Moon with an in-studio excerpt of his new version of Us and Them. We're going to listen to it here in a second. Word emerged last month that he planned to re-record the entire Pink Floyd album. He also plans to release a new solo album he made during the COVID lockdowns. Dark Side of the Moon, released in March 73, celebrates its 50th anniversary this month. So he says, quote, When we re-recorded or recorded the stripped-down songs for lockdown sessions, the 50th anniversary was looming on the horizon. And um, let's just play a little bit of this clip here. Um... I, I think I have it. Oh, do I not have it queued up yet? Here, hold on. Let me pop it open here. This is a re-recording. Roger Waters uh, doing Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, this is an excerpt from the album. It's the track Us and Them. So let me play that for you guys. And I'm going to switch my screen so you guys can check it out here. Uh, here we go. Where's the website? There we go. We'll just do it that. second here it is all right here it is here's roger waters re-recording of us and them just a little excerpt god only knows it's not Okay, 
So there you go. David, what are your first impressions hearing that kind of re-recording? Mesmerizing. Uh, it does sound very good, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think of that whole kind of thing of re-recording an official release, though, of an album that you guys did together? You guys are at odds as a band. And now one of you is going back to that work, even though it is the 50th anniversary and it's a fitting time to do that. Um, two things I'm thinking. Did he have this in his mindset kind of all along? I can't wait to re-record that album uh, the way that I want to do it just because of Roger Waters' kind of controlling nature with, with Floyd. Or do you think it came from like what he's trying to say, a place of honesty where as an old man he's looking back wanting to uh, do that album maybe a little more justice, highlight some of the stuff on the album a little differently. What do you think? You know, I got I got a lot of respect for Roger Waters in, in different ways. Um, but, you know, in terms of the intergroup dynamic, I do think, think that seems a little bit unfair. You yeah, know, and especially not to have them involved in, in any way, right? Yeah. Uh, he didn't involve David Gilmour or Richard Wright into the process. Yeah. Um, he says, quote, it's a way for the 79-year-old man to look back across an intervening 50 years into the eyes of a 29-year-old and say, to quote a poem of mine about my father, we did our best, we kept his trust, our dad would have been proud of us. And also it is a way for me to honor a recording that Nick, Rick, and Dave and I have every right to be proud of, end quote. However, controversy surrounds it because it was re-recorded without help or knowledge from David Gilmore and Nick Mason, both still alive, both still very musical. Uh, as Rolling Stone pointed out, Roger Waters told The Telegraph in February that he did it, quote, because not enough people recognized what it's about, what it was, what I was saying then, end quote. Yeah, I, do, that, I mean, it seems like he's just... I mean, shoot, they're, they're the only ones who are going to know what went into the creative sure. process. But us as fans or just general public speculating on the... On the facts that we have here, that does seem a little self-serving. You know, it's it like kind of does. But I mean, shoot, he's someone who's very, very committed to his like politics and and his vision. And his vision. Yeah. So I mean, for better or for worse. I mean, I gosh, it's like it's a little self-serving. But what do you expect from an artist? Like, you know, that's kind of the way it goes. Like these these great artists are uncompromising yes right? very much so very much so so i mean yeah i guess it is that way but you know the original I wish i cared that much about uh <laughs> something that i was doing my dis i'll go back to my dissertation and rewrite it <laughs> right 50 years later yeah 50 years later <laughs> something that no one ever point. read yeah i don't think <laughs> they, they didn't got get the point, point yeah, right so let, me, let me make this a little <laughs> more clear for you guys now well it's uh, both versions are going to be out there soon enough so i'm sure we'll see that full release in a week or so okay so to come back to this story this is we, we had a little more info that was revealed and i think it's starting to build up to something like what you david originally were kind of like i think something fishy is going i on am here. a prophet well <laughs> you had that instinctual feeling like something's not right they didn't get hacked you're like come it on it seems weird it seems weird right so this photo showed up uh, on their um, website that says time to go touch some grass and people were like what the go heck outside. is that yeah what does that even mean uh, it started this last weekend when they were quote unquote hacked of N sevenfold that a cannabis <laughs> reference <laughs> fake it could be fake cancellations for festivals were posted there was a deep fake AI replicant of vocalist M Shadows and he actually got onto the band's official podcast to read a f off a false statement as a deep fake AI bot, so oh that was gosh. that was kind of crazy. And then they responded that none of none of what anyone was seeing was true. Eventually, listed this statement, which we reported last week, that said our accounts were compromised, our festival appearance have not been canceled, and we were kind of speculating like, did someone uh, actually maybe get drunk and go in there and just be like, ah, yeah. oh, this is all bullshit. Just I don't want to <laughs> do that. Or. Is it part of maybe a, a more elaborate ruse here that I think may be that maybe they're um, trying to make it seem like they were hacked and it could be part of either an album release or a tour announcement thing. So the plot thickens. The games really began when this hacker revealed themselves to be this guy called Libad5343. He took a picture of himself, logged in 
to Avenged Sevenfold's accounts, right? And then this Twitter account <laughs> for Avenged Sevenfold um, had this post uh, picture that posted up on the Ritz, which is it's a very um, weird venue. So okay, so they got these coordinates, right? They were uh, posted to the uh, Avenged Sevenfold Discord account. Remember last week where they're like, follow us on our Discord for all the activity, right? So it seemed like they pushed everybody to the Discord, and then this popped up, these coordinates on the Discord. So fans looked up these coordinates, and it figured out that it leads to a venue in San Jose called the Ritz. Uh, it's a funky little venue. One of the fans actually went out there and took a picture of it, and on the front, on the marquee, a it says, My bad, 5343 presents nobody. And so uh, everybody's like, what's going on there? And then on the Avenged Sevenfold website, there's some kind of thing about nobody. Apparently, no, Nobody Seeks Misdirection is from the studio's Reddit bio for um, Avenged Sevenfold. And so they're saying that maybe this might be tied into the new album, some kind of a tour. We don't know, but Redditors are, are trying to figure it out. And they, um, they figured out that it said something about meeting at midnight on Monday. But nothing happened this past Monday, so we don't know what's going on. Something so it's not necessarily like the, what was that, Joaquin Phoenix, I'm still here, or whatever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he turned it into a rapper. Yeah, not, not, not that Not exactly. Elaborate. It's not materializing just yet. Not that elaborate, not that cool yet. Um, I hope it turns out to be something cool and not lame, but it does seem They had it all elaborate. planned, and then they forgot, <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, what, oh we wait! We were that. supposed. To, oh, yeah, dang it! Yeah, oh, we were supposed to play at the Ritz, and we never did. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Uh, we'll we'll find out. Okay, so let's move on to some more uh, news. Which this one brings up a bigger picture that I kind of want to talk about. That there's a lot of bands like this. Uh, sadly, you know, I'm not. You know, I'll just say it. I'll be honest. I'm not a huge fan of this band, Godsmack. I'm, I've never been a fan. I think they're just like a very kind of generic. <laughs> generic goofy <laughs> rock and roll band like they just, like they have very cheesy stupid songs about like kicking ass and whatever you know I, I feel like godsmack was in a in a space of my life when it, that's the only thing that it was to me it was, it was just like what is this you remember it, it reminds me of like creed or something yeah, like, or, 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 like know, a like, that that type of rock and roll that was in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. It was just like it had its moment, right? They were cool at that time. And now they're trying to tour the United S or the, the rest of the world besides the United States. They had to recently cancel a tour in South America due to lack of ticket sales. Uh, they tried to just do three dates. Bummer. In Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, and they had to cancel it. Um, and then they were asked in this new interview, could they do Australia? And he says, this is Godsmack drummer Shannon Larkin says, quote, not yet. And the honest truth, can we afford to come? It sucks for, uh, for us because we're here. We're big in America. We're an American band. The radio loves us here. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be a big band. And we didn't really have the success worldwide that we have here. End quote. And that leads me to my point that there is a lot of bands out there in the United States that are generic rock radio bands that the rest of the world has no interest in just mm. that's like the sad truth you know like there may be a small section of people that want to go see godsmack in south america but not enough to sell three dates at these places um and warrant a tour down there so do you think it's something like it's almost like i feel like sometimes like we're fooling ourselves with some of these bands that they get on the radio. You hear them on the radio. You think they're big. They're like, yeah, oh, rock radio. I mean, wait, we're playing. You hear them on the radio. But it's almost like the state of rock radio is so bad and so shitty that we don't have hardly anything to choose from. That when a band like that does come out with a single, it automatically gets on the charts. It automatically gets radio play. Oh, Godsmack's got a new single? Oh, okay. Yeah. Five Finger Death Punch's got a new single? Oh, yeah, put it on there. And it's all shit. They're all, like, bullshit songs. That if you tried to play them overseas or whatever, people are like, this is what what is this? You know, yeah, it doesn't hold water. You know, yeah. I mean, to me, it's sort of like there's a I guess if I put on my my geographer's hat for mm -hmm. a minute. Yes. It's a little bit of an ethno specific community right. where it's like there is a segment of society 
that needs that as part of their daily diet. And when it comes to like a broader, maybe artistic appeal, it doesn't go beyond that. Maybe yep. this is a possibility, yeah, right? No, it doesn't go beyond that point. ethnic specific community. Not saying ethnic in the terms of like an actual like you know Race. racial category, right. but your like cultural demographic. category, right? Demographic. That demographic category, right? The, the workaday dude who just wants to hear a song that kicks ass as he's driving yeah. around in his truck, you know. Which you know, I I I can I can see what's going on there. You know, it's sure. like you want to have a particular feeling and it's not really for the artistic quality but you're like you know i'm working a long day and i want to feel like kind of cool as i'm doing it but then so. that question also so it's more uh, like muzak is know? it worth it even for that work day guy though the the joe schmo driving around in a truck that just wants to hear a kick-ass song would he pay enough would he shell out over a hundred dollars to go see Godsmack at a show in his area or would he uh, wait? You know, or would he just wait until we are on a festival lineup, and then maybe I'll go see him? But do you think that workaday dude, even here in America, the guy, the the guy that they're playing to, is even going to want to go see Godsmack at the Shoreline, you know, and shell out his hard-earned dollars for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder what the ticket sales are on that. Like, they're okay I, in the U.S. They're just like kind of any other generic band, but they're not great. Okay, they don't sell out. You know, they're not one of those bands that's that type of a draw. And I feel like we're coming to this point with a lot of rock radio that there's going to be a lot of bands in this situation that they don't. They're not going to make any more new music. They they, they want to just be kind of like almost like a fair band and just like play the hits, play United States places that are friendly to them and that rock radio uh, appreciates, you know, places like the Midwest and Southern places. They're not huge in New York and California and some of those more, you know, multicultural areas. They're really popular in that kind of the the bread belt of America or whatever you call it, right? Yeah, the yeah. They're one of those groups, you know. So anyway, there yeah, you go. Yeah, I can see that. I God see smack that. not touring overseas due to lack of ticket sales. All right, we got an update from Travis Barker. Check out his uh, surgery, kind of like a big W zigzag scar on his the win yeah the w <laughs> uh, on his uh left pinky finger there he's doing okay uh he's got to uh go through recovery here and blink 182 has tour dates lined up for may still so i don't see how they're going to be able to do that in time to be honest now are they still going to are they still going to go down to south america nope they canceled that tour um, last so the time May we were, the May dates are in the U.S. The United right? States. Okay. Yeah, that whole South American tour was uh, planned for March into April, and that's been scrapped. Well, there you go. Blink One Eighty Two is gonna start playing the fairs, <laughs> right? It seemed like a, uh, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where I really hope it, he gives it enough time to give it the proper healing and do it the right way. Quit trying to rush it. That's pretty astounding, though. I mean, it, it's that. That much of a scar? Gosh. Like, yeah, they had to really I mean, there. I saw the pictures last week, but... It was dislocated, and I guess it was a torn ligament. So, oh, so they had to get in there and yeah. actually... Because you, you get a torn ligament, you're, you're it done. Kept, you can't yeah, it move kept it anymore. dislocating, and, and so they had to get in there and do surgery on the torn ligament to make sure that it wouldn't keep d dislocating. So, pretty wild, huh? Get better, Travis. Um, all right. This was kind of a cool story. I thought this was interesting. So... Marty Friedman, over the weekend, played a show with Megadeth, and it was one of the biggest trending things on Twitter at the time in Japan because Marty Friedman used to be in Megadeth back in the 80s, in the original uh, lineup of Megadeth. Well, he's been living in Japan since 2003 for 20 years, and he's become like this TV personality over there. He's, he's like larger than life. He's like a big dude. And That's very surprising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting. And he wanted to focus, the reason why he stayed there in Japan, he wanted to focus on playing J-pop music. He said he wanted to concentrate on that, but they said, quote, just try this TV thing. Your Japanese is very good. You have a very interesting viewpoint. Give it a try. So he started doing, he's on this talk show in, in Japan, uh, and he's part of this group here. Look at this funny group. <laughs> 
it's like oh my, this, it's like a variety it's show. Like, yeah, it's like a variety show with their own rock band, and he's the guitar player in the rock band, and they have this whole like you know campaign and all these advertisements and everything, and he's become this huge celebrity over there. You know, I gotta say that's that's a little bit of a step up, right? Right. <laughs> that's that's. I mean, to be, and I don't. I mean, I I don't know quite how how big he is, but to be uh, the old guitarist for Megadeth, that you're not really a household name. No, and right? now he is, and that's kind of what he. That's what he's saying. He's like, he's bigger than he ever would have been if he would have even stayed in Megadeth. Uh, and and all and it, to be in Megadeth, he's just associated with some really weird looking, like bones in the face and. Uh, writing that says <laughs> yes. Megadeth that your cousin has on his T-shirt, right? Yep. And he says about the TV show in Japan, he says, the first thing out of the box, it was a really big hit. It lasted for six seasons. For the uh, the new show, it's unheard of. So other offers came up. My management over here started filling things up, and the next thing you know, more people know me from television than music. And recently, he played with uh, Megadeth, their first Japan tour in a while, and he joined them on stage and did a couple songs with them. And it really? kind of went viral, and people were, like, blown away who have been growing up watching him for the past 20 years, not knowing, well, kind of knowing that he came from rock and roll, American rock and roll, but never seeing him actually play with his old band, with Megadeth. And that was the first time since he's been there in 2003 that he's played with them on stage in Japan, and they were going crazy. Everyone's blown away. They were like, whoa, oh, my God, Marty Friedman, you know? He really is amazing. He and is a, wow. And they like now, had this great relationship.
probably get drawn out, yep. right? And then it so brings, yeah, it brings a lot of attention to their it organization. It brings the attention. Yep. It gets more support. Yep. Um, that's a good way to 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 spend your time and when you are you one of these influential people. What do you think Dave Grohl's uh, code name is? Uh, uh, he apparently he has a code name that they use for Dave Grohl. <laughs> Uh, on text that um, I guess he he uses as a code name. What do you think his code name is? I'll give you a hint. It is has the eagle. No, it has it has his initials, D G G. So if you had to guess for a code name for Dave, D G, Doggy Dave. Doggy Dave, Dulce and Gabbana. Dulce and Gabbana. <laughs> D G, <laughs> Dulce and Gabbana. Yep, that's about right. Isn't that funny? Uh, D and G. Nothing. Don't D and G. Yeah, code name. <laughs> That's what he has on his uh, satchel. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty awesome. So Dave Grohl, man, just a badass dude. All right, let's get to some birthdays this week. How about it? Birthday time. Birthday. Happy. Birthday. Happy. Birthday. Birthdays in the rock world this week. David, take it away. Tom Scholz, multi-instrumentalist and producer of uh, the band Boston, is 76. Jeff Ament, bassist for Pearl Jam, is 60. 60. Wow. Uh, Rick Rubin, the producer of Public Enemy, Slayer, Slipknot, The Beastie Boys, Dixie Chicks, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Audio Slave, Johnny Cash and Metallica is 60 years old. That's a nice little resume. Yeah, he, but he I mean does look a lot like like sort of like Moses or <laughs> John Muir or something or the local man digging in the trash. Uh, right? Yes. Like maybe just... it was there with Dave Grohl. <laughs> he, he, you know? He, some Rick Rubin could have been one of those that were fed. That's yeah. very true. Uh Joel Madden, singer of Good Charlotte is 44. Benji Madden, guitarist of Good Charlotte, is 44. Are they twin brothers? They are twin brothers. Look at that. Yep. One of them is a lot more inked, though. Um, <laughs> That's true. Mark Lindsay, singer uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, is 81. 81. John Cale, musician of the Velvet, uh, Velvet Underground, is 81 as well. Robin Trower, former guitarist of Procol Harum, is 84. Trevor Burton, Singer and bassist of The Move is 74, but that is apparently disputed. That is disputed. A lot of these rock and roll, I don't know why they're disputed. They don't want people to know their real age. I, yeah, I wonder. No maybe idea. he's uh, maybe he was uh, born in the hills. <laughs> Didn't get Without an official a, record. In a bathtub. <laughs> uh, Randy Meisner, former singer bassist of uh, uh, Poco. The Eagles is look at this seventy seven. This photo snapped it at a, like a the back of a Albertson's dumpster. Yeah, that look. Yeah, that looks just like uh, <laughs> the uh, ninety nine cent store back behind. What the hell are you taking this photo for? No sunglasses and that. Just the combination. Yeah, there, it looks like a real cool it's, it's dude. It's happening. He's happening. Right. Mike Alsop, guitarist the Three Dog Night, is seventy six. And okay, no comments on that. He looks very happy and content. He and like he eats he, very good meals. He looks like he is going to make me some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he could make some real good cookies he, and milk. He does look like he just that's looks his real really passion, content. right? That's his true passion is making cookies. Ah, uh, not in that's not a comment on his weight. He just looks so friendly. Yes, he does. I think it's the haircut. He could be I a think good it's the Santa. haircut. He's he got good hair. Santa, uh, I think. uh yeah. <laughs> Every year. Uh, Ernie Isley, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame guitarist of the wow. Isley Brothers is 71. Look at that shirt. Man. And he's got a rose on his headstock, too. He ain't messing around. That's yeah. from the 80s. That, shoot. <laughs> There's sequins. There's like the coin sequins hanging. Yeah, that is, yeah you're he right. He looks freaking rock and roll. Wow. wow. Like a pirate. <laughs> uh, Peter Wolf, former lead singer of the Jay Jeels Band. Former husband, oh, Jay Giles, sorry. Former husband of Faye Dunaway is 77. 77. Faye Dunaway. Uh, Matthew Fisher, former key, uh, keyboardist of uh, Procol Harum, uh, is 77 as well. Yep. Is that a real picture? I know. 
It looks like it's photoshopped, right? It really the head turn in there, and it looks like <laughs> it he's, doesn't look real. He's got a sweater vest. I couldn't on find there. any picture of that guy either. So I maybe. think maybe that is doctored, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, Chris White, former bassist of the Zombies, is eighty. Eighty years old. Now, when were the Zombies? Uh, like the fifties. The fi- that 60s? idea. I mean, the, zo- the the idea of a zombie, even in yeah. Western culture, is I pretty n- newly introduced. That's a yeah. That's, I think he's they were cutting the edge there. Late fifties, early sixties. One of those first like kind of groups like that. Look at that pinstripe jacket. Yeah, it's like uh, Kingpin. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh Grundy, drummer of the Zombies, is seventy eight. They got the same birthday. I guess so. David Gilmore uh, of Pink Floyd is 77. 77. I think this is the last one. Yep. All right. Time for some trivia, guys. This week in rock and roll history. Trivia. Okay. Time for some trivia. This week in 1974, guys, this band plays their very first show, which takes place in Newcastle, England. What band was it? Was it A, Black Sabbath, B, Queen, C, Bag Company, or was it D, Beetle Boot, Crosby, and the Cocaine Mod Squad? David Crosby fully naked on stage wearing just <laughs> thin English leather boots, freebasing cocaine from a broken light bulb while staring ominously at the crowd in silence. <laughs> kind of a strange tour, kind of a strange show, wasn't well received. I can I can uh, I can see that in my mind. Yeah, Beetle Boot Crosby just Beater standing there boot. naked. Beetle Boot Crosby. <laughs> no, the 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 uh, staring ominously at the crowd in silence. Was that the, the you showed a picture of of him a few weeks ago and yeah. I, it he was it was terrifying. <laughs> it okay. could have been from that show. It could have been. I'm thinking it maybe, but I don't remember seeing like any Swinging scrotum or anything. <laughs> All right. You could have blocked it out. You know, you could have. Yeah, maybe. Out that I, you know. Memory. Okay, let me tell you. I just on that subject before we get to this answer here. <laughs> blocking out memories is a real thing, yeah. man. Yeah. I I had a recollection, probably like ten years ago, that I was on a girls' softball team when I was like eight years old. Wow. And I was like, Mom, Dad, why do I keep having these memories of like cute little girls playing softball all around me? And they're like, they're like well, we wanted you to learn how to. We didn't want you on a t-ball team because you, you <laughs> we wanted you to have, have a slow pitch opportunity so you can hit the ball in the air. And I really, I blocked it out. I think it was like so so disturbing right. to me that I was on a girls' softball team. <laughs> That's one of those things in life. That's why I hit them homers. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, okay. Let's what see. Do, do I get a ch- do you do I yeah, get a yeah. guess? Okay, let's right. see. Um it's 1974. Yep, 74. And it was in Newcastle, England. I'm going to go with Queen. Queen? Yeah. All right. All these active bands around that time. Turns out it was Bad Company though. Bad mm. Company playing their very Okey first dokey. show. In Newcastle, England, this week in 1974, Bad Company, from Looking their good. album Bad Company, from the single Bad Company. All right, so let's move on to some more trivia. We've got a bonus trivia question for you here. This week in 1973, David, this musician pled guilty to charges of growing marijuana outside his Scottish countryside farm and was fined a whopping $240. He claimed he didn't know the seeds would grow. Yeah, right. <laughs> Who was it? Was it A, Ozzy Osbourne, B, Paul McCartney, C, Jimmy Page, or was it D, Scottish satyr Crosby? David Crosby as a half-goat, half-man Scottish satyr with a pan flute playing the local hill tunes of his fellow wooden creatures frolicking in the moors of Scotland. <laughs> uh <laughs> Scottish satyr Crosby. <laughs> With the horns, right? Yes. Like Pan's, yes. Pan's Labyrinth. Half goat, half man. Man. With the pan flute. Uh, can you let's see. That? I can I can <laughs> see that, but he has to have his little newsboy hat on still. Oh, the, yeah, I think he did, and then the horns were popping through it. The horns popped through it. Mm-hmm. Or do they, do they wrap around it and sort of cradle the hat? Oh, they could have done that as well. 
could the happen. loving the loving arms of his horns. Um, I think it's who's who's are any of these Scot? They're none of them are Scottish. None of them though. are Scotland. So it's his Scottish countryside farm. So as an additional it's property, countryside. And this is in what year? Uh, Seventy three. Okay. So he's already got to be like wealthy they're enough to have like a Scottish. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's go with uh, let's go with Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page. Not Scottish satire Crosby. It's actually Paul McCart- McCartney. It's always McCartney. Paul last McCartney. Time I, that happened to me I last know, time. I know. He's just a little rap scallion. Uh, Ooh, at, I like that. Look at his uh his home little here. his little Scottish. That's the home in question. And I mean, come on. You could do with some. Who the hell cares if he's yeah, growing I mean, a really. couple little plants out there? You could do with some plants. All he's got is grass. <laughs> you need some bad. real grass. Yeah, right. Man. <laughs> All right. You ready for some new rock and metal oh, okay. album here releases? Okay. Here we go. Some new rock and metal album releases in less than 30 seconds. David, take it away. The Atomic, and I quote, Bitch Wax, <laughs> live at Freak Valley Fest, The Banishment, Machine and Bone, Blackmore's Night, Shadow of the Moon, 25th Anniversary Edition, Demons, Own, Demons Down, I Stand, Duel, Live at Hellfest, Accelerate, Arrival, um, for the Fallen Dreams, uh, For the Fallen Dreams, Gora, The Orb, Judiciary, Flesh and Blood, Lala Ayjala, and Albert Witchfinder, Ordeal and Triumph, <laughs> Nano War and Steel, Dislike the False Metal, Otherwise, Guz Dwelling Air, Perfer- Periphery, Periphery V, Zent is not a genre, Roadrunner United, The All Star Sessions re release, Roadrunner United, The Concert, Seven Crystal Wonderland, Suicide, oh, I almost made it. Almost, almost. Suicide Silence, Remember You Must Die. And Unfeld, Fall of Endless Perdition. <laughs> Some great albums. Right? Some great albums. Fall of Endless Perdition. Right. So what that means. What does that mean there? I know what it's perdition not endless is. anymore. So it's the fall of. It's the fall of the of endless. Being endless. So perdition will end. There See, you go. it's positive. You know, it's mm. a positive thing. I could take some of that ending of the perdition. All right. Movie, TV, entertainment news. TikTok being targeted, new bipartisan bill, uh, going to give the federal government the power to ban the use of TikTok in the U.S. Look at that. Oh, that's okay. No problem. What do you think about this? They've been talking about this for a while now. TikTok's owned by a Chinese company. There have been concerns about its collection, possible uses of data on its users. So do you think... It's really about that, or do you? Think it's uh, what do you think? You know, I think it's funny because do you remember back in the like late? No, no, I guess the two thousands, sort of like late two uh, thousands, maybe mid two thousands. The big thing. I mean, I was in college and I was studying history and like East Asian studies, and I, you know, I lived in China and stuff like that. Right. And the big thing they'd always talk about is China banning Google or and other other uh, U S things like things. that. So, it, I mean, I, I mean, there is a little bit of irony here. I mean, obviously, you know, China is a a a a, a different sort of authoritarian than we are. Yep. Um, but gosh, uh, it's it's sort of it's sort of interesting. Uh, I I see this, and bef- without going too too far uh, along the ro- a road to talk about this, but I see this as sort of a you know. The U.S. is shaping up to to get some war hysteria. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that there's there's Using there's TikTok a threat, that. right? Yep. That's our big thing right now. Is right. you know, obviously we've got Russia doing their imperial project in the Ukraine, and uh, you know it's crappy, um, but it's all kind of uh, it's all seen in light of the uh, relationship between Russia and China. And, you know, Russia's kind of energy demand or China's China's energy demands being met by Russia. And then we can see a little weakness here. Right. We've got this space open because China's tech sector is really uh, competitive with the United States tech sector. And I think that's a that's our value added industry. That's the one that we earn a lot of our money with. So, uh, you know, I think I think that uh, it could happen. You know, it's people looked at it as a joke, but I mean, a lot of those things that Trump was doing during his administration, yeah. Biden's more or less kind of fallen in line, playing you know? right along with it. Like, okay, yeah, we'll do the anti-China stuff. So, 
Very much so. We'll Quickly see how change. it goes. Um, I don't see anybody not using it. I don't see how they would really ban it. I guess take it off of the app uh, marketplace. Yeah. I mean, what's so bad about TikTok? It's not a balloon. <laughs> right? Very true. <laughs> it's not a weather balloon. It's not a weather balloon. <laughs> All right. This was kind of crazy. Um, did you hear about this crazy train derailment in Greece? It was their deadliest train disaster ever. Yeah, I heard uh, about 57 this. 57 people died, and the station master is accused of negligent homicide. He was jailed. Um, you know, the prime minister apologized and all this, but it was pretty, pretty bad. Um, an examining magistrate prosecutor agreed that multiple counts of homicide causing ba da 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 57 people, many of them in their teens and 20s, were killed when a northbound passenger train it's a head on, and right? a southbound freight train collided. Yeah, man. So, there's really no excuse for that type of stuff. If you're the one uh, running uh, those trains and that type of uh, thing seems like just very negligent and horrible. And I mean, I kind of wonder on this. Like, I don't know. I haven't read up enough on this, but it's sort of like, you know, the thing in uh, Ohio. Yeah. In East Palestine, the big, the big complaint uh, really coming from the uh, from the the train workers is that this this sort of thing uh was bound to happen because derailments happen all the time uh trains are too heavy there's not enough pe people managing them they're yep. using this uh precision scheduling so that they can work the people as much yep. as they possibly can and yep. so the derailments happen all the time but then this sort of thing is just so tragic that i mean i don't know i don't know exactly what happened here but i sometimes feel a little skeptical or a little bit suspicious that this guy uh who is the train you know the 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 what does it say the well, station master the station master um is taking all the blame but in some cases yeah right you know is that really is that i mean is is he overworked like yeah is there a lot more going i mean i don't know i really no, don't right. know this that's story point, man but i mean that's the thing i think we often go hey you know those those folks they just should have been doing their job but i know greece i mean they're going through a period of time where uh, the co the country is in debt to to, right. to foreign banks, and they've had to struggle through and cut back on all their different uh, uh, social. Say, I mean, pensions that were promised to people, they they're not getting them. You yeah, know? it's like it's it's illegal according to their country's laws, but the the banks uh, that could you know must be paid. On, so and that could take a toll on morale, um, stress. Uh, working more hours, all those things like yeah. what you're saying that, you know, who knows what the real, you know, hopefully they do some investigation, figure it out. Yeah. Regardless, I, yeah. It could be lost. the guy was just uh, not doing his job. Yeah. Don't, maybe don't he really just know, but it. could have just, you know, totally, you know, but who knows, right? Just very tragic all around. All right. This was crazy. Uh, this new black mold, they're calling it whiskey fungus. Oh yeah. And I thought that was a pretty cool name for a band. Whiskey fungus. Oh, would you call it? <laughs> uh, the, this whiskey fungus has been covering homes, cars, and even trees near the Jack Daniels Distillery in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Look at how thick it's getting. Is it, and it makes people it says, like... quote, we are going to look like Jurassic Park. Couple sues and blames Jack Daniels for whiskey fungus near warehouses. So it's this big black fungus that's like uh, coming from the, the vapors. From the oh, it's vapor. So it's not like people walk up to you and then... Breathe into your <laughs> no, mouth, no, right? no. None of that. It's, it's apparently from the brewing process in Lynchburg. These huge, gigantic whiskey barrels uh, are brewing this fungus that's that's getting out into the community that's surrounding and all the locals that are by this. Brewery. Wow! They've had to power wash their homes to get rid of it, and uh, so that you know now this couple suing uh, the the company Jack Daniels, and they had the statement here, quote. Could it be a nuisance? A Jack Daniels rep said, "Yeah, sure. And can it be? And it can be easily remedied by having it washed off." End quote. So it sounds like they're wow, really, yeah, just being like, "Screw you!" Being a bitch about it. They're like, no. "Jack Daniels rep." Yeah, you can just that's, wash it off. Sure, it's bad, but you can wash it off. But I mean, look that's, at that. But that's the that's the uh, that's the mo, man. That's the externalities that you put on society and then get profit. This big corporate America right in the middle of this community is wow. like, yeah, just wash it off. Why don't this, you just wash it off, you, black fungus you snowflake? That, that's probably getting in their lungs, too. I mean, no one's talking about the health concerns here. 
like black fungus is horrible like in no matter what form it's in right so, oh yeah well i mean that's gosh god <laughs> that that is just that is just rotten yeah pretty and then jack daniels to give him that kind of a response right gosh just washed it off we'll give me give, a free pressure washer yeah we'll give you all free why don't uh, you come washers? wash it off then yeah isn't that crazy uh all right this is a shocking scary kind of story man dies of brain eating amoeba after rinsing sinuses with tap water. This was in Florida, of course. Freaking Florida. Unidentified man did this. Florida, daily. Florida man. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That was... Florida man is a great name for a band as well. I should not be. I should not be saying that in this case. But, but yeah, so I guess he did this daily uh, for many years using unboiled tap water. Say that the source was a brain-eating amoeba, and this is the first case ever reported in the U.S. during the winter. I will say... That I remember, I have very vivid memories of my dad washing his nose this way, mm. growing up. He would be underneath the sink, and he would cup the water, and kind of like, kind of do a little inhale, yeah, like and inhale then... and exhale, and blow his nose with it. Your father's the he's, he's living the on the wild pre, side. He's the proto neti pot man. My God. And after watching this, though, I don't think I ever want to do anything like that. So, so I mean, neti pots, are you supposed to use, like, sort of, like, distilled water or something I like think, that? I think in the neti pot that you're supposed to use uh, purified water. You're not supposed to use untreated Dude, I tap water. have not. I have <laughs> used the you're, regular. You're walking on the wild side. I know. Well, maybe that's why I act the way that I do. Because <laughs> you have a brain I've got an amoeba curled up in there somewhere. <laughs> Gosh. Could be, so. Well, you know, I will say, I'm, no, I can't say, I'm just trying to think of bad things that i can say about florida right now <laughs> uh yeah, plenty of bad I mean, things to say sorry are... if there's anyone out there listening from florida <laughs> i really can't apologize no they know they know yeah they're like yeah it's it's cool man <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe but, yeah so don't do that don't wash your uh nose with un un um cooked tap water or unboiled i don't know that sucks or at though. least pick the amoebas out yeah, first try and, yeah get you know if there, there's those big ones, you know. Get a pair of uh, tweezers and get them out of there. All right. Okay, we're not going to get too much into politics, but I wanted to mention this. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley stepped into the treacherous political waters of Social Security form reform this week. She is calling for changing the retirement age for Americans now in their 20s and limiting benefits for wealthier Americans. By changing the age, she presumably means raising it, Current law entitles those born in 1960 or later to full benefits at the age of 67, but reduced benefits can be taken starting at the age of 62. The last time this was messed with was our birth year, 1983, there year 82. But it's been 20 years, or 40 years, excuse me. Do you think it's time to raise it, or do you think this is politics? What do you think is going on with this Social Security age stuff? Oh, I mean, it's... It's uh, politics, if you ask me. But, I mean, the politics is this. It's that we have a wildly profitable corporate sector that cannot be taxed mm -hmm. or will not be taxed. And really roughly starting in that year, 1983, huh. in good old Ronald Reagan's time when he decided to crazy do his thing. Lined up? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, shoot. It's, it's, it's one of those things. I mean... Uh, if you read, there was just came out with a, a report from Oxfam in, uh, two months ago, and the you know the top the top one percent took in I think something like two thirds of all wealth created in the last uh, two years. Oh, that's fun, right? So it's like it's one of those things. There's a lot of there's a lot of money going around. It's just that it's not going to the people who are creating the value in society. My guess for the new age. 70. Good gosh, man. And the early is 65. I think they're going to raise it by three years. And 70 that. years old. Yep. Make us work till 70. And then uh, if they, well, may, I mean, if we, if they're, you know, if the robots aren't doing our jobs by then, at least we'll have a, we'll have a job at 70. <laughs> right. That'll be good. Yeah. Something to look forward to in 30 years from now. If I'm not fucking dead from some other crazy circumstance, maybe from an amoeba. And, get, uh, yeah. If, if I don't get a brain eating amoeba, from you got to go to move to Florida. 
I'll get my uh, what is it like? You get eighty seventy percent of what you made or something? Yeah, yeah. Something really shitty. It's all chuckles today, Chris. <laughs> Fun times, oh, man. candy corn, and okay. This was some good news. I thought that at least maybe there's a sea change happening here in the mentality of Americans and what's good for us and what's not. For the first time in history, more Americans favor legal cannabis over legal cigarettes. Look at that. According to a new Center for Disease Control poll, 59% support legalizing marijuana and 57% are in favor of banning tobacco products. Only 21 states have legalized cannabis. Uh, Four states consider weed consumption fully illegal. I don't know what those four states are, but I don't want a vacation there. Probably Um, uh, Utah, maybe Florida. I know Alabama. Alabama. Probably Mississippi, something like that. One of those places that has a, you know, a <laughs> infant mortality rate the same or as a, Sri Lanka. Um, a, Literally, <laughs> a different flag of from the 1800s as their flag that they all like to brag about. Oh yeah, when they were uh, <laughs> rebelling against the rebel Union flag. Anyway, what do you think of this? Just as a, a general type of thing, do you think? I'm not saying necessarily marijuana is. Definitely any better than tobacco in some re- in regards. I guess it may have some medical benefits, but I do like the fact that we're finally starting to get the idea of eliminating tobacco. Like th- that's never been a thing where it's we've had more than fifty percent in favor of actually banning tobacco products. Maybe not using them, but actually banning them and saying these are you know detrimental to society. They're causing a huge drain on our healthcare system. I, I remember one of the examples that I always like to think of and use when I went to Canada in 2004. This was back then, 20 years ago. They are very ahead of the curve in that regard that they had all of their prices for alcohol and tobacco was like double than what we were paying at the time, right? Like, So I remember in 2004, a pack of cigarettes in Canada cost like eight, nine, ten dollars $10, which was crazy. In California at that time in 2004, it was just up to maybe four, three or four, maybe five at the most. Okay. And that was a big deal, right? But the reason why it was double in Canada at the time was because all of the proceeds from the sales of liquor and tobacco went directly into the healthcare uh, system. So everybody that was using it for emphysema, lung cancer, liver cirrhosis, all those problems that you're actually using your healthcare system for, Mm -hmm. it was being funded by the people who were doing that to themselves. And I really like that idea, even though it kind of, it kind of screws you. If you're trying to have a good time, you know, smoking and drinking, you're going to pay double the amount, but it's because there's free healthcare in that country and all the people, the majority of them that are using the healthcare system it's because they were using those products, tobacco or alcohol, and that's why it costs double because that double the cost is being pushed into the healthcare system. You know, there. I mean, there. I I think there's something to that sort of strategy that is compelling. You know, it's sort of like, you know, during the during the last few big waves of COVID, where there are all those folks that were like not vaccinated and they would end up clogging up the hospitals while other people were dying of heart attacks because they couldn't get into the in to see the doctor because it was so overwhelmed um where you you know sort of attaching it to the behavior that's going to tax the social system right really does uh really does discourage that behavior yep and it makes those people that kind of either don't want to participate or want to self-destruct being the ones that actually fund the public health care system the most. And it's, yeah. it's very creative that way. And it's like, yeah, okay, if you don't want to, you know, do this, you're still going to have to pay way more than you should because of that reason that you're wanting to do these things. Yeah, you know? that is something to think about. The thing that I think is interesting about it is it does seem like a cultural change. It does. You know, the idea of, uh, you know, marijuana being now – more uh acceptable than cigarettes that's it used to be that that yep. uh that cannabis was more closely affiliated with minority groups and was therefore you know stigmatized yep and it was uh, lumped in 
with all those schedule one drugs. Yeah. Like methamphetamine. That and, that is, gets you in big, big trouble, yeah, even though nothing, it was a nothing in any way similar to what the inherent uh, you know, uses or or um, structure of cannabis. Chris, so, are you whitewashing uh, the reefer madness <laughs> that's gripping our nation? Dude, I just I've always seen that uh, as a smoker of cigarettes and cannabis. I I see through kind of that whole thing, and I've I've seen it ever since the you know the reefer madness days of propaganda from big tobacco. Big tobacco has really dominated our media space in a very subliminal and very um sneaky way yeah and they don't advertise they can't advertise uh you know their cigarettes right so what they do is they attack the other stuff they attack cannabis they attack all these other things that are their competitors so to speak to make to paint them in a bad light whenever you're seeing these things about marijuana oh it's you know oh i forgot my kid at soccer practice you know oh uh, i don't know what i'm doing paid for by big tobacco yeah, right it, you won't see that necessarily in the in the black and white writing, but that's who's funding it and that's who's pulling those strings is to make it. They still have that angle, and they're still doing that. You'll see ads like that that uh, are either from Big Tobacco or they're part of an initiative where um, cannabis actually has to do that to themselves. They have to ha- have uh, they have to show ads they're required. Yeah. Yes, it just m- like the way tobacco is now. But tobacco does it still in a very sneaky, stupid way. They they try and do these commercials that are almost like um, like a um, like a joke or like a um, a, a cartoon or a TV ironic show. And yeah, and it doesn't really hit counterculture the, it hit or something. The, yeah, it doesn't hit the points the way it should, and they know that they know that they're making a commercial that's supposed to be like anti them to make it triv- trivialized, to make it seem, like, stupid. To wear uh, a smoker yeah. Beer. Yeah, <laughs> that's fucking stupid. That's stupid, man. Yeah. man. And it just feeds right into their base mentality, right? But I mean, gosh, man. Ne- the nefarious practices of the... Uh, I mean, it goes even far beyond <laughs> that. It's the crazy, strategies man. of the cigarette company, of the tobacco yeah. companies, were used in a lot of the science that was sort of, like, questioning of the connection between... Uh, tobacco and cancer those scientists being you know sort of funded by the tobacco industry there's some of the same scientists that were later on used in the uh deflection of the science on global climate change right right i can think of their names great job with that yeah we could bring you like oh you're an mit you're an mit scientist and you were willing to do that come on over here and you can create some doubt Right. Uh, surrounding Skew climate change data. for for Exxon yeah. Mobil and other twist this data around for us yeah. in our favor. Yeah. yeah, you're right, man, and and that's the sickening part. So hopefully you guys are seeing through all that, and we could just bring you little bits and pieces. You guys make your own decisions. That's it for us this week. Rocknewsweekly.com for all the episode info, all of our socials at Rock News Weekly. Watch us live every Sunday. twitchtv slash Weekly on demand. YouTube.com at Rock News Weekly. If you enjoyed our episode, however you're listening, please rate it, please share it, get the word out. We appreciate it. Help our algorithm out. Uh, And we'll see you guys next week. All right, have a good one. Peace. See ya.